our next speaker this afternoon is Rosemary Shira. She is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and faculty in the Departments of Environmental Studies and Forestry and Wildland Resources at Humboldt State University. She received a BS degree in geography from the University of Oregon and an MA and a PhD in geography from the University of Colorado Boulder. Her research and teaching interests include biogeography, landscape and disturbance ecology, climate change and ecosystem management. Her current research activities focus on understanding past and present effects of climate change and disturbance on forest ecosystems in Colorado, Southwest Alaska and Northern California that are relevant for current and future land use management. Rosemary. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear myself. All right, thank you. I just also want to share that I really enjoyed the conference um, and learned a great deal. So thank you for the organizers of it. Um, and, and before I begin, I want to talk a, a little bit of, and acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Rudd Platt from Gettysburg College, and he's done a lot of the um, fire behavior modeling that I'll be talking about. And then my other collaborators, uh, Tom Veblen, Tonya Schoenagel, and Meredith Gardner, um, who've uh, uh, done a lot of the data analysis and the, the site level um, fire severity um, data that I'll talk about as well. Um, so I want to start out actually quickly reviewing some things that have already been talked about in this conference and, and we're well aware of. Um, using this quote here from National Geographic in 2008, I want to focus on the last uh, question here, why is the West ablaze? And so there are some things we can say broadly across the nation in North America that we know, um, and using two images, one of that we've seen temperature rising over time uh, in recent decades, and then this map shows the spatial distribution of the early 21st century of average temperatures in 2000 through 2007 compared to 20th century averages. So you can see really high temperatures, we all know this, in the western U.S. and in particular in the southwest and in interior portions of um, the west. Let me see. Clicker no longer works, that's okay. Um, and then, so you, we know temperature has is, is, uh, been a main factor among other climate conditions that have, have driven uh, recent uh, fire activity or the increase in fire activity. But we also know there's been a century of change. But when we look at the uh, compilation of, of changes of different land use histories and uh, fire suppression effects, we have to think about that in a regional context and even from a regional context into local environments, thinking about different vegetation types and variability across the landscape. So when we think about fuel buildup, we know that there has been a reduction in fire and that's led to changes in forest conditions, but in some areas more than others, as Jerry Franklin and others have, have, have emphasized. And so that has a variable influence on this increase in wildfire, or bark beetle, um, other disturbances we've seen. Now, another factor that's been briefly discussed here at the conference is this issue of the urban wildland interface, among other issues. And I, let me use the mouse here. I want to focus on um, Colorado here. So I want to zoom in here and look at two maps from uh, uh, Dave Theobald. And this map shows in the, just focusing on the gray areas of development in 2000. Here's Denver. And then this is the projection into 2030. So we know that even with whatever economic situation we're going to have into the future, we know that we're going to have widespread development into areas that we know are fire prone in the Colorado Front Range, among other areas. So when we look at this type of landscape that's mostly forested in the areas where we're seeing urban development, I'm going to focus on in sort of addressing some parts of this question, which are uh, in this complex landscape, can we effectively reduce that vulnerability to people and property while also maintaining biologically rich environments and ecological resilience. Um, ecological resilience, everyone has um, defined. I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm focusing on thinking about the structure and function of those ecosystems. Uh, and so if we have disturbances that happen, then it doesn't qualitatively shift that system into a new state, like a non-forest system. Now, um, earlier today, we heard more about the um, Colorado Front Range, and, it, and it, it it's useful for putting that in context, um, uh, where I just want to focus on a little bit about the variability in the montane forest, which was already covered this morning. 
Um, from the lower montane forest, it abuts the plains grassland ecotone here. I keep forgetting the clicker doesn't work. And uh, what we see in these landscapes is a higher grass uh, component in the, in the ecotone as well as into the forested areas in those areas that are more in the lower montane zone. And as you grade up into the lower to the upper montane zone, there's high variability in forest conditions today on the landscape, as we know historically there were um, variability uh, because of aspect and other uh, topographic factors. And another main point I want to mention is that the montane forests in this system are dominated by ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. So later I'll talk about mixed conifer, but the predominant species are ponderosa pine and Douglas fir with some mix of lodgepole aspen and limber at the highest elevations. Now from previous work by um, my, uh, myself and collaborators as well as um, other people in the range uh, in, the, in the area, what we know is that the fire regime is a mixed severity fire regime, but there are areas that have been characterized historically more so by low severity, this frequent fire uh, regime type. And that would have maintained more open forests, and I know I don't have to go through all this uh, for you. Uh, there also were other areas that were characterized by more moderate and high severity fires, and a couple of things I want to mention, what we would expect is to see more variable dense forests, and also in high severity areas, evidence of some sort of age cap uh, in these systems that would have had higher severity fires at various uh, spatial scales. Now today I want to focus on sort of synthesizing some work and, and pulling together some new work that we've done in, in identifying this um, key goal, which is to identify where specifically there's been a shift in the fire regime and where restoration will promote ecological resilience under changing climate scenarios. And I'm going to focus today in thinking about two questions. One, how does historical fire severity compare with recent fire events and potential future fire across the landscape? And secondly, at least start to think or start to address the second question, which is how can we use these comparisons to inform strategies for managing forests and fire under um, climate changes that we expect and effectively promote that resilient ecological condition that we're looking for into the future. Now I'm going to sort of divide the rest of my talk into three, three aspects. One is historical fire severity, and then I'll give a take home message on that, and then secondly, thinking about recent fires in context of that, and then third, uh, potential fire in, in context of what we know about the past. The study area in the montane zone, um, if you're familiar with um, my work and others that are on collaborators here, most of that work has been focused previously in the ponderosa pine zone, which is in, or ponderosa pine uh, stands, which are uh, shown in yellow here, and, and focused in this area here in Boulder County and in the Arapahoe Roosevelt National Forest. So now we're looking at a much broader extent of the montane forests that range from about 1,800 to 3,000 meters. And um, in terms of vegetation, what we're looking at is the land fire existing vegetation type. And as an aside, it's not that great outside of the ponderosa pine cover type when we look at how it predicts our sites. So for example, the mixed, severi or the mixed conifer, um, when we look at our sites, the, the proportion of our sites fall with most of those as ponderosa pine dominant and mixed with other species and Douglas fir and some components about 18% dominated by lodgepole pine and aspen, aspen being about 2%. The other um, species listed in the uh, uh, existing vegetation is lodgepole pine, a little hard to see here but it's that bright green color in the upper portions of the montane zone. Now the other thing you can see on this map are these black dots which represent a series of sites. We have 200, over 230 sites where we're reconstructing the past fire history as well as the effects of those fires on, the, on those individual sites. Some of those sites, about half, uh, are stand level sites where we can understand the effects of those fires across the stand. And then uh, another half, roughly, 112 are smaller in scale where we're reconstructing it at, at basically a plot scale. And the, um, the uh, let, me, let me move to the next slide because I know I'm going to be short on time. Uh, so what I want to emphasize in this map is the uh, gray area represents the general study area. And using methods that we've outlined in previous studies, we've characterized each one of these sites into the historical evidence of a historical fire regime type. So uh, in um, sites that are shown as black dots, those are um, sites that don't necessarily show any evidence of moderate or high severity site uh, fires in the historical record. 
And this is an example, this um, graph of showing something that we're looking at at one of these individual sites. So this dashed line represents effective fire suppression in our landscape, which is around 1920. Here, these represent individual fires, so this freak, more frequent fire regime. And we see a high um, proportion in the historic record of remnant, very little cohort development. Actually, there's trees that date prior to the 1700s at this individual site. And we established that this is showing evidence of primarily low severity at this site. Um, sort of moving in another example site, we have other sites that show less frequent fire, uh, these being two spreading fires, and we see pulses of recruitment in very little remnant trees prior to individual fire events. And some sites show basically a single cohort, um, but in very um, little or no remnant trees prior to a single uh, fire scar or not a single fire scar, spreading fire scar. So spreading fires across that landscape, representing more of a high severity event that occurred in subsequent development. So we've, we've identified sites that at least show evidence of moderate or high severity. That doesn't mean they, they haven't had low severity fires, but that is some evidence. And one of the goals uh, is to identify these sites, but secondly, to identify which site conditions to do we see these different fire types. And so what we've done is looked at environmental variables, both cover type and um, physical predictors. And I just want to share some of the highlights of that with you. And first of all, thinking about vegetation, it's important to think about vegetation and fire type. And in fact, when we look at the sites where we're characterizing low severity sites versus mixed severity, so I'm lumping moderate and high severity into a mixed severity uh, fire regime, because we see a lot of overlap in the environmental site conditions where you find high severity sites and moderate severity sites. So co cover type is not significant, but there are trends. So if you look at the low severity sites, which are few, but in the black dots, and there are 18 sites, the majority of those are ponderosa pine. 80% of the stand is ponderosa pine. Um, but we also see ponderosa pine in mixed severity sites as well. So it doesn't come out as a predictor variable, but there are trends. And it's not surprising that 67% of those low severity sites are ponderosa pine, which stem in these yellow areas, because a lot of the uh, low severity areas occur at lower elevation. Now, the, the main factors that we see uh, that drive the locations of where we find differences between low severity and more mixed severity are two factors, one being elevation, uh, and then another being slope steepness. Now, these black dots represent low severity sites, and uh, the mixed severity are shown as the white dots here. And so just uh, quickly, well, I just want to share that I know you can't see these numbers, but what we see is that low severity sites tend to occur at low elevation, most of those occurring between, before uh, lower than 22, 62 meters, or 60 meters if you're interested in that number. And those that occur above that, just a couple sites, only occur on low slope steepness, so not at sl high uh, slope steepness. Another uh, pattern that we see, in fact, is that the mixed severity fire regime doesn't occur at the lowest elevation ad adjacent to the plains grassland ecotone. Um, but where it does occur in the lower elevations, it tends to occur at slightly higher slope steepness. So these two interact, and those are the most um, important variables that we find to be the best predictors dividing out these two fire regimes. So using those uh, variables, uh, we have mapped out where we would expect to find the differences in these dominant historical fire regimes across the landscape. So this is the same map, but now showing a map of where we would expect these two fire regimes. In green, you're looking at areas that would characteristically be dominated by the low severity. This supports work that we've done previously, but that work was really concentrated in a much smaller area. So similar, and it's also similar to other work that's been done recently using um, historical records. Mixed severity is um, the majority, 72% from this predicted model. And then we look at the accuracy of that. Low severity sites are predicted, um, you know, 94% accurate, um, 17 of 18 sites, and we can see that they're all occurring primarily at lower elevation. And the mixed severity sites, there's a little less accuracy because some of those we know mixed severity fires might have occurred in the lower Montanzo, but much less frequently not the dominant fire regime for if we're characterizing where we would have found these historical regimes. So that first take home me message here is that when we think about historical fire is that to topography matters. This isn't something that we don't already know, but we can delineate where uh, historical fire regimes would have been dominant and the effects of changes in fire regimes and prioritizing restoration. Cover type in this landscape 
It's not significant, but there are trends. Uh, we see higher proportions of ponderosa pine in areas that historically had low severity fires. So on north facing slopes at low elevation, there are natural Douglas fir dominated stands. And those areas would be much less likely to have that low severity fire regime historically. And the predominant historical fire regime in the montane is really more dominated by what we call this mixed severity fire regime that incorporates all different types of fire. Okay. The second part of the um, thinking about uh, change is uh, thinking about recent fires. And so here on this um, same map, we ha I have listed the four largest fires, recent fires in the Front Range study area, uh, with the Hayman Fire being the largest in Colorado's history, and then the High Park Fire being the second largest in the, um, in the, in the Front Range study area here. So I want to just highlight one comparison of the fire, because I'll run short on time otherwise, okay, which is uh, thinking about the High Park fire in comparison to the historical severity. So about 16, in using this map of burn severity after um, looking uh, at this data, what we see is 16% is mapped as unburned. So the numbers up here just focus on those areas that are burned. So of the High Park fire here, this area up here, this map shows 44% as low severity, that's the green areas, and then 56% as mixed severity, most of that being moderate. These two numbers add up to 56. Now when we look at, this is overlaid, now underlaid there is the historical model, we can sort of just broadly compare, re recognizing that these are different measures of severity. One is an actual fire, and the other is a predictive map of the historical fire regime. But when we look at these numbers, what we see is that historically we would have predicted higher amounts of low severity, slightly, uh, and uh, lower amounts of mixed severity. So there appears to be, comparing these two, slightly higher amounts of mixed severity fire in this fire, but not necessarily an enormous amount more, and that that uh, change of more mixed severity is occurring at low elevation where we would have predicted the uh, historical low severity fire regime. Okay, so oh, what, let me go back here. Um, Quickly, okay. Uh, now the Hayman fire we know is much more severe, okay. And so this area is mapped as very. In, in a, and earlier today we saw really incredible photos of the severe fire that that ha, um, happened in 2002 in the Hayman fire. And so when we look at the Hayman fire in the our study area, which cuts off part of it, just this area here, and we compare amounts of fire types, we see that actually proportionally using this map and the historical fire severity. The, the actual fire in this map shows 30% within our study area shows low severity fire, and the historical map actually shows 30%. So proportionally, that area burned is similar. But when you look at where the historical low severity would have been, it's under here, you can't really see it, but it would have been right in this area of high severity. So those areas of low severity historically are the areas that burned very severely in the Hayman fire at lower elevation. So my take home message on that is that um, the historical evidence, although different types of severity indicators, re uh, suggests that recent large fires had some areas of higher severity in the past. This is primarily at the lower elevations where we've seen a lot of forest change, but the overall amount, just using the examples that I gave, of low and mixed severity are, are not necessarily that unsimilar to what we've seen in, in the past. Okay. There's a lot, lot of words up here, and I'll just, I'll, I'll help, uh, you don't have to worry too much about it. But the third aspect of thinking about it is, what do we expect across the larger landscape with fire? So um, using some methods we've done previously for um, Boulder County, where we've looked at the urban wildland interface and fire hazard, uh, which is in a publication from 2011, we're looking at predicting potential wildfire across this broader region using uh, weather scenarios. And so we've looked at average conditions and we've looked at extreme conditions. And so here I'm just going to talk about the extreme conditions. And so we're using a 99th percentile um, weather conditions, extreme conditions in the historic record as a measure of what potential fire we might see. So just some, some uh, indication of, of what this means. Um, with the A2 high mission scenario projected out into the lat latter part of the 21st century, those 99th percentiles in the historic record that, that's modeled out at 39 percentile, meaning that we're and towards the later portion of the 21st century, we're looking at potential average temperature conditions. So into the later part of the 21st century. So 
we're mapping out the potential wildfire, but you want to have some idea of, you know, how good is this, is this model? It's just a model of fire behavior using fuel um, conditions and weather scenarios. Uh, so what we've, we've identified or done is looked at uh, a simple check of actual fire weather during these four major fire events, the actual fires, uh, as a ch check of realism. And so the, the, the two of the fires were um, done in 2011, and we've added the two more fires into this analysis. So it's a simple check of the realism of the results for different fuel types. And what the results brought, generally show, just quickly, um, uh, is that when we see higher burn severity, for example, in each fuel type, looking at these separately, we tend to see higher amounts of pr predicted crown fire or higher amounts of predicted fire line intensity values. So that makes intuitive sense that these models uh, are predicting some sort of level of realism for the larger landscape. Okay, that was a lot to digest, so I can answer questions on that or do my best uh, later on. But what I want to do now is think about this larger landscape and potential fire. So let me talk about what this map shows. It shows two an overlay of the historical fire severity map, low severity prediction versus um, mixed severity in the historical record, and then overlaid with the potential fire risk scenario, that 99th percentile, so that extreme fire weather. So the green areas and the dark orange areas show those areas that historically would have been predict or predicted to have dominantly a low severity frequent fire regime. So in the green areas, finding my mouse, um, what we see is the, the potential uh, fire behavior map predicts those areas as surface fire today under extreme conditions. So this suggests in those green areas, those are mostly on the, at the lower elevation, although there's some areas up at higher elevation on low slopes. Those areas are not outside of the range of variability. We would sort of just hope that fire is allowed back on the landscape. Those are not necessarily our restoration priorities. The areas in dark orange are areas that historically are predicted as low severity, but today, under extreme conditions, at least using this model, are predicted to have more extreme fire behavior. So those would be the areas where we look back at some of the restoration efforts going on and target those areas for restoration. The areas in yellow and, um, and uh, the tan color are those areas that were predicted historically as mixed severity fire, and today either have potential for surface fire or potential for torch. A lot of the surface fire happens in areas that are adjacent to grasslands or at grasslands in the upper elevation. So these areas are less of a priority for thinking about that there's a departure from the historical range of variability. We know that there were higher proportions of moderate and severe fire historically in these landscapes. Okay, short on time, but I'm going um, uh, I'm going to skip the image, well, show this image here. These are images you, you've probably seen um, before, but these are the lower elevation where we, we can see in the landscape that there are denser for, uh, forests today, uh, which supports uh, higher amounts of fire. But in the mid and upper montane zone, we know that historically before fire suppression, this is 1905, we had severe fires that have small proportions of remnant trees surviving, and today we see a dense stand on that landscape. And so many of the fires that have occurred, this is a little hard to see, there are pockets of, of trees that did not burn in these areas, and this fire tends to burn in the way that we would expect historically across in the upper montane zone as well. So short on time, but just real quick, when we map out certain fire events that show up across the gradient of sites, these 232 sites, we see some fire years that show up really widespread. So for example, let me just take one fire year, 1786 are the blue dots. That's well before Euro-American settlement. And what we see is an extensive area that burned within the front range. So we certainly have had widespread fire years in the past. So my final take-home message in my final slide is uh, thinking about this all together, um, what we can say is there has been a predominant shift in the fire regime based on uh, pulling these data sets together, but it's primarily been at lower elevations or in the upper elevations on low slopes. Uh, these would be the priority areas that I would emphasize for management. So we can now, using this data, sort of refine that lower elevation area that is targeted for uh, restoration. And it, in these areas, we meet multiple goals. Recent fires actually show that the spatial perimeter of those areas is within the extent of historical fire event years, 
But using our sites across this larger landscape, we certainly can't speak to the patch size of severity given that they occur across um, non-contiguous areas. And at lower elevations in these current fires of the areas, we're really seeing higher severity and those um, are the areas, again, that see the greatest change. And thank you very much and I'm happy to answer questions if there's time. I know I was long. What's that? Okay. Oh, good. All right, great. Rosemary, you guys have the beginning and you were characterizing, excuse me, you were characterizing the fire issue in June. You, you talked about age and age cap. Mm -hmm. Did you explain Yeah, I did. They go into a lot of detail on that. So, um, what we've looked at is each individual site. For one, we have the fire history record, and second, we have the age structure. So let me take a couple of examples in taking the extremes. Um, the way we're looking at it is trying to create some metrics, and these are metrics that are used in other areas too, and are listed in uh, the, the Schoenegel paper in 2011, where low severity sites, looking in the historic record, show 80% or more of remnant trees, meaning trees that date older than an individual fire event prior to fire exclusion, and very little recruitment following those fires. And we see in those sites uh, often a real lack of fire, that, that real long fire suppression period. In high severity sites, what we see is that, what the criteria is that after a fire event, we're only reconstructing back to the last moderate or high severity, severity based on our criteria, not trying to reconstruct events back through time that are difficult to do using reconstructive methods, where we have um, less than 20% of the trees that date prior to that event. And at our site, we're systematically sampling tree ages, but we're also subjectively going out and looking for the oldest trees to get in a sense of the oldest trees out on the landscape, if that helps. That's one of the, one of the key metrics. And then also looking at, you know, proportions of cohort establishment as, as additional information for, for looking at severity following fire. I have a question about your uh, attempt to reconstruct historic spatial patterns of fires, and like the 1786 fire that you, you that showed up there. I'm curious if that comes from um, fire scarred trees or if that comes from yeah. age data. Yeah, no, that's a good, really good question because our larger data set, because certainly when you go back through time, like you look at the green dots, the 1654, those are fire scar dates. And so in this, you're, you're right, most of, the, like those dates, we don't have the co you don't have the tree ages to sort of support if the fire was low severity or high severity at that time oh. scale but a lot of the dates as we go towards the late the mid to 1800s or present even 1786 we do have those dates so a proportion of these sites we can identify the severity but not all of them and so you're you're absolutely right that this is a this is a map of the extent of individual fire years but but doesn't tell us much about the severity the way I've presented it here. We do have it, but it's not as extensive. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's good. Um, in some of the work that I've been involved with on the front range, we've been looking at a aspect north versus south facing slopes as a potentially big driver in moisture gradients and vegetation patterns and productivity and fuel accumulation. And then assuming some interaction with fire behavior and regime following that, yeah. but it sounds like you didn't really do Yeah, that. no, no, actually, let me, let me just say, ask, just repeat briefly what you, what you were talking about is in, in your analysis, which presented this morning, they're looking at um, other topographic factors, Aspen, I mean Aspect, uh, Aspen in my head, somewhere, Aspect, and, dis, and ravines as fire breaks, and I, I did forget to mention, in fact, that that is exactly what we find too. We're just not finding it to be the best predictor across the landscape. So with, when you look at sites that, are, that burn at high severity or higher severity, they tend to occur on more north, not all of them, but they tend, there's a tendency, north facing slopes, steep slopes, and ravine breaks away from ravine breaks. And that's really what we see with actual fire behavior, uh, at least in these, these large fires too, is that we see the remnant trees surviving those fires and it's higher severity up from that. And so those factors that you're using are exactly what we find, and it's very similar to, to work that we found at a smaller extent. So that's great to hear that you're using those. Can you just 
Kevin. Yeah, no, that's a really good, that's really where this should go, right? So um, we, we have done it for Boulder County, but not actually this, not overlaying the historic one also, but with the fire potential, very similarly, and that's in that um, 2011 paper. So we haven't taken it that far, but, but we should, and, and I hope to, so that's a really good point. I mean, those are really the, the issues of this hazard issue that's for people and places. Well, thank you. Thanks very much.